different approach, whether it's, you know, refill too soon at it's removing those. So, um, so members can re, uh, refill their prescriptions quicker than they would in the past to, you know, putting in specific clinical programs, or I should say waiving specific prior authorizations or any other clinical edits that they may have just in support of the COVID-19. All right, great, terrific, thanks Rob. So, and now back to our regularly scheduled program, as we were saying. Uh, so a little bit about what's taking place in, in the group market space right now with employers and, and, and self-funding. So really ever since, I, I guess, uh, the implementation of the, of the Affordable Care Act, self-funding for employers have become, has become uh, 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 definitely a topic of interest. It always was in the past, but it really kind of heated things up then just because it provided some additional you know, autonomy for employers, let's say. Um, and also absolutely insight into their actual spend. Um, they really have the ability, once you're self-funded, you're going to be able to get a lot more in the way of claims data and reporting. And as I mentioned, really give you some insight into your group's specific spend as opposed to, you know, just kind of keeping your fingers crossed until 90 days or 60 days in advance of, of the renewal. Uh, certainly, you know, when we work with our clients, we try to get early release on the renewals whenever they're insured and get access to as much information as we can. But a lot of times our hands are really tied by the insurance carriers uh, based on, on their timelines and, and the criteria that they have for the various market segments. So self-funding, I mean, as I said, the, the main thing for, from our perspective, the huge benefit is that you get access into, into some of your data and you can really start to drill down some utilization, the trends. Um, you also have plan design flexibility when you're self-funded. So, um, you know, both on the medical and the RX side of things, you can get a little creative uh, and you're not stuck with just the plan designs that the carriers have filed with the states. And then generally there's savings to be had, obviously is the, the main reason why employers are looking to do it as well too. So, you know, I, I, it, even with that though, I think you need to be, be cautious if somebody's telling you you're gonna be saving, you know, 30, 40%. Um, the, the big savings is coming from, you know, obviously there's, there's fewer taxes that you're gonna be paying in the self-funded environment. Um, your admin fees are a little bit lower, you know, but you are gonna be funding the claims as, as you go. So it's uh, definitely an approach where if you're looking to get a little more insight into your, your claims and your experience and get creative about some ways to ch control your costs, uh, it's definitely worth looking into. Additionally, um, there have been some real gains in momentum with regard to transparency in the recent year plus. Um, I guess back in January of last year, there were CMS rules that took effect with regard to expectations now of healthcare providers and hospital systems um, providing information specific to their, their actual costs for various services. Initially, you know, a lot of this is still, it, it's, it's a work in progress, let's put it that way. Um, but the good news is that there is definitely traction here and momentum towards more uh, access to transparency and insight into the true cost um, that, uh, that employers have on their, their drug spend and their medical spend. So a little bit has been postponed, obviously, based on the election year we have here and some of the other, obviously, uh, developments. But we really think that this is going to be something that continues, especially since in the past couple of years, employers have really been putting the emphasis on their members becoming consumers of health care, just like we are of really any other service out there. And the one key piece that's been missing with that has been really the access to the information. And uh, that's been acknowledged. And there's definitely a push towards more transparency and insight into cost. So what is a PBM, uh, Pharmacy Benefit Manager? Really an organization that's gonna aim to do several things for you. Uh, they manage the purchasing, reimbursement, and dispensing of prescription drugs. Um, you really have the ability, especially if you're, say, a 200, 300, 500 life employer, uh, oftentimes you can take some advantage of those economies of scale, and, and Rob can talk about that more in upcoming slides in terms of the way that they help employers do just that. Um, they create and maintain pharmacy networks, so access to to various chains um, and pharmacy providers where your members can, can get their prescriptions filled. Uh, they create formularies that can influence prescription patterns, prescribing, excuse me, patterns, uh, and maximize the rebates, which is gonna be um, a key component of our, our conversation here today, uh, helping employers to, to, to share in some of the savings there and take advantage of some of the, the rebates that are out there and lower their costs as a result. Um, they administer clinical and disease management programs to support effective utilization so uh, some of the things we might talk about later is step therapy, uh, uh, utilization management, some of the various programs out there. Negotiate prescription drug pricing, which is a big one. As I mentioned, they really use those economies of scale to try and drive down the 
cost of drugs for their for their uh, members. And I'll let Rob tell you a little bit later about the unique way that they kind of look at that each year and to ensure that their uh, the employers that they're working with are getting the lowest costs on those particular drugs and the, uh, the most advantageous uh, rebates. They operate or contract with mail order pharmacy to take advantage again of uh, the ability to purchase in quantity and have programs to help those individuals who have specific conditions of a maintenance origin to make sure that they're make it easy for them to continue to maintain or continue to take their drugs on a regular basis and adhere to, uh, to the, the uh, prescribing of their, their providers. And then uh, they undertake efforts to contain the cost of prescription drugs as well too. So uh, really kind of as a result of all of the above, uh, they're really looking to help them partner employers, partner with employers to keep their costs down. So how do they uh, help plan sponsors save money? I won't go through all the bullets here, but a lot of the issues that we had discussed before. The discounts. So the pharmacy benefit managers are generally leveraging their market share to negotiate better discounts as, as we mentioned. Um, and there's really two main discounts, I would say, the, the brand discount and the generic discount. And Rob, I didn't know if there was anything in particular you wanted to, to address on this slide. Yeah, I think, you know, I think I'll hit a little bit on this as I kind of go through my slides. But it's, yeah, it's not just, you know, brand to generics or retail or mail. I mean, obviously, specialty discounts are going to play a big part in this as well. Sure. Um, you know, specialty right now is, is a big factor in trend. Uh, pharmacies representing about 40% of overall pharmacy costs, um, where 10 years ago, that number was probably around 13%. So there's been just a big influx of specialty medications that are out there. That's kind of what the manufacturers are concentrating on now. They're not solely looking at generic opportunities um, because the money is really around the specialty end of it. Um, and an organization such as Rx Benefits, where I've worked for the last few years, are able to offer more aggressive discounts across all lines, including specialty, that just by doing nothing and having a contract with an organization such as myself is, is contributing to lowering costs. But we'll kind of get into that a little bit. So, uh, and again, a lot of these slides here, I'll go through them quickly because I'm sure it's going to be a really a refresher for, for a lot of folks. Uh, but basically, one of the key components when you're dealing with a, a PBM is the, the formulary, which is really that list of preferred drugs, um, preferred and non-preferred drugs, I guess I should say, but they're classified uh, within the individual PBM's formulary, uh, selected based on quality and cost. Um, the formulary listing can be greatly influenced by the rebates that the PBMs may receive, but also based on different uh, factors such as, you know, drugs when they come onto market, which ones have moved into generic categories. Uh, and each PBM really has it's the ability to select the drugs that they're going to place on that formulary, and they can change really throughout the year. Rebates, we talked about it, um, several forms of, of rebates, but these basically are the, the refunds they receive from the manufacturers for the inclusion of their products on a formulary. Um, and Rob will get into more detail in the following slides in terms of the way that they work with employers and, and try and uh, maximize the, the savings and the rebates that those employers are getting back to help keep their costs down. Formulary compliance, really a number of ways that compliance is achieved, obviously through communication and education with the membership, but also with the pharmacies at the point of sale, um, patient and physician education. Uh, there's uh, multiple tier copay structures that can really try and drive utilization towards the lower cost medications, often the generics. Um, therapeutic interchange programs with the physicians to use the formulary medication instead of non-formulary. Again, a lot of it's really driven by the communication between the PBM and, and the providers as well. And then all these programs can increase the amount of rebates potentially. Uh, Rob, I didn't know if there's anything in regards to formulary compliance you wanted to touch on? No, I think you hit it. I, I think you hit it. We'll probably dive into it a little bit, as I mentioned, too. Sounds good. These are great both. So then plan design. Uh, PBMs are using specialized designs to help uh, save and, and keep employer, employer spending low. Uh, we talked about the multi-tier plans. So three-tier, four-tier, I guess some five-tier plans now. As Rob mentioned before, specialty really becoming the main driver in terms of the spend uh, with regard to prescription expenses. Um, prior authorization, quantity limit, step therapy, there are all various aspects of a utilization management, advanced utilization management programs that employers can, can implement to drive costs down. Um, I know and Rob will talk about, I'm sure, in the coming slides as well too, but 
with a lot of these programs, employers do have the flexibility to uh, grandfather certain segments of the population. So if you're going to put in uh, any of these utilization management programs and you didn't want to have an adverse impact on, on current membership, folks who may be utilizing the, the medications, uh, you do have the ability to sort of grandfather existing populations and roll out some of these programs you know, on a go forward basis only. So there's a lot of flexibility in terms of um, how you can utilize these various uh, these various programs. And then again, even separate prescription drug deductibles, just like we have on the medical side of things, you know, an upfront deductible before any cost sharing with the plan occurs, there can be, a, you can implement separate prescription drug deductibles on those plans as well. So in terms of shopping for PBMs, where well, I'll be turning things over to Rob, just to kind of dive into uh, some of the specifics and things that the ways that they work with employers. Yeah, so so thanks, Chris. And again, thanks, everybody. Chris, just a quick question. If anybody, you know, has questions or anything, I know we probably have most people on mute, but are we just going to set aside some time at the end for questions? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yep, we have, and uh, also, if folks uh, want to, they can take advantage of within the application here, there's a, a feature where you can ask a question as well, too, and I'll get notified. But uh, certainly at the end, we'll have time. And then also, after the fact, you can email me directly if there's something that comes up afterward. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks. All right, so so again, I appreciate everybody's time. I'll kind of just give you a little uh, history and kind of where Arx Benefits fits in the marketplace, how we, because we're not actually a, a pharmacy benefit management company. We're not a PBM. I think that's always important to get across first. We were kind of, I guess, defined as a pharmacy benefit advisory firm. Again, I work directly with brokers and consultants such as Chris. Um, I manage the Philadelphia Metro market on behalf of Rx Benefits. Um, and some of the things that Chris kind of touched on around plan design and things of that nature are all still well and good. But, you know, I brought up specialty before, you know, some of those old plans to, to you know, increase deductibles, increase co-pays across plan design, you know, I will say worked rather well probably 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. But now because of the rising cost of a lot of the medications that are out there, just doing, you know, um, altering the plan design um, from a lower to higher copays is not necessarily going to work on a specialty side. So my organization has kind of come up with a lot of clinical programs in the industry specifically around specialty. And we'll kind of dive into those a little bit um, because kind of doing things the old way are not necessarily working today. And you'll see what you know some of the PBMs and even what they're not doing, especially around the carrier level, um, are not doing to satisfy overall costs and kind of keep trend down. So just a couple things you know here on slide 19. Uh, what should you analyze? What should be looking at within uh, the PBM world? You know, key contract provisions. How are contracts written? length of the contract, um, what goes into the contract. It's obviously discounts, uh, rebates, dispensing fees here, the formulary, the formulary, any admin fees that may be out there, things that uh, Chris kind of touched on. I mentioned the clinical program options, um, you know, looking at pharmacy networks and reporting capabilities. And, you know, a lot of this falls true when you just kind of even think of a self-insured versus a fully insured. You know, Chris hit on a great topic before, you know, when I do an analysis to, from a savings standpoint, and we're gonna get into how all that works, but it's not always feasible to do an apples to apples financial analysis when it's a fully insured group, because as Chris mentioned, you just don't have access to that data. So when you're working in a self-insured world, that data is readily available and provided by the incumbents. So whether it's a carrier or um, a current carved out model with one of the PBMs. So when I get that information, I can do a true apples to apples analysis and show you where savings is available um, versus your current contract, versus your client's current contracts, um, things of that nature. We'll, we'll dive into that a little bit as well. So kind of just moving along, you know, first thing I wanted to kind of talk about is a little agenda we put together on page 22, things that are very important in the marketplace now. Um, what's happening in the pharmacy world compared to the past years. As I mentioned before, I've been in this industry for quite a while. So I've seen, I've seen a lot of things come and go. I've been on the carved inside. I've been on the carved outside. I've worked for Fortune 500 companies. I've worked on behalf of Fortune 100 companies all the way down to mid-market clients as well. 
So just to kind of put it in perspective, you know, pharmacy or RX is the fastest growing component of healthcare costs today. Um, today it's used by more than half of its members each year, um, averaging 10 prescriptions per member per year. So pretty aggressive numbers there. Uh, here I have marked out complexity. Um, one of the things to always look at is there's always a lot of moving parts within a contract, um, within the pharmacy world. There's a lot of optics that are in contract languages now from the PBMs as well as from the carriers. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of those optics and the language in those contracts are really looking into the best interest of the PBMs and the carriers. Um, the next topic around access, I'm sure you're all aware of all the mergers and acquisitions, consolidation of the PBMs that have been going on over the last couple of years. Uh, quite frankly, it's not anything new. Um, Optum and United Healthcare, or Optum was formed through United Healthcare in their merger with Catamaran about three years ago. I was actually at Catamaran when that whole process started. So I've seen, you know, the ins and outs of, of how it works and where the pitfalls within that. And I'll kind of dive into those, but I'll give you a great number. Um, you know, three years ago when United was still working solely by itself, they were showing around a 3% gross um, net income per year, which is, you know, which is a decent number. But whatever, since they merged with Catamaran and formed Optum, their total cost share, their, I'm sorry, their total revenue is increased by like 28%. And you think about that, you know, any clients under that model, you know, they're not seeing anything less in, in um, premiums. At the end of the day, those organizations are making money on behalf of those organizations. They're satisfying stockholders. The salespeople are, you know, making money by focusing on large opportunities such as Fortune 100 companies, government entities, health plans. That's where they see all the money. Their focus is not so much on the mid-market space or what now we refer to as non-Fortune 100 companies. Um, that they don't see any real value in there, and that's where an organization like mine, RX Benefits, comes into play. And, and I'll kind of get into that a little bit, but. At the end of the day, as I mentioned, those clients are focused on the, the Fortune 100 clients. That's where they're going to make, make all their money at the end of the day. Um, the next topic around pharmacy practices, you know, we look at kind of artificial inflation and what does that mean? Well, think about um, a specific drug that's out there. I'll give you a great example. Mylan, which is a manufacturer of the drug EpiPen, which I'm sure everybody's heard of. In 2009, they charged that they charged for that drug around $100. Now, in 20, 2019, 2020, the cost of that medication alone went up to $800. And it's really a lack of competition that's out there. So they're able to kind of charge what they whatever they want to charge. The next topic around specialty, as I mentioned, it's fast approaching about 50% of all pharmacy costs. Ten years ago, that number was at 13% of total costs. And what's really eye-opening about that is utilization is pretty much stayed consistent. So I think, you know, 10 years ago, utilization under the specialty was around 0.3% of the membership utilizing specialty drugs. Now in 2020, it's only about 1%. So again, little increase in utilization, but just the cost factor has increased so much because of those uh, specialty drugs. Um, and then really around clinical focus, and I think this is somewhere that RX Benefits really separates itself from, from the PBMs of the world. Um, our trend right now is in the negative numbers where industry book of business is probably anywhere between 2 and 5%. And we've put such a focus on the clinical aspect, bringing that in-house to my organization and kind of taking it away from the PBMs because it kind of goes in line with what I was saying before how the PBMs are looking in the best interest of the PBMs. So they're coming up with clinical recommendations at the end of the day are gonna line the pockets of the PBMs. Where my organization, and again, we'll get into this a little bit, uh, is looking at clinical recommendations based solely on each specific client and their members' utilization. And we're able to kind of focus on that. Our programs are, are totally optional. We're not pushing them down anyone's throat. Um, so we're looking in the best interest of our clients and their members. Uh, slide 23, Chris, please. So just kind of give you a little bit of what's going on in the marketplace and what we consider a void or a gap 
in the marketplace for non Fortune 100 companies. You now, as I mentioned, you know the PBMs um, are represented by the three largest PBMs in the country, which are ESI, CVS, Caremark, and Optum. Those three PBMs alone um, have 80% of the total market share, which equates to around $280 billion in annual drug spend. Um, I mentioned before, these PBMs are actually not out there quoting on the non-Fortune 100 clients. You know, it's interesting. You know, I, I just keep using the 10-year frame, but 10 years ago, uh, mid-market or non-Fortune 100 companies were considered around five to 10,000 lives and less. Now in the PBM world, the mid-market is considered 25,000 lives and less. So you can kind of see their focus going again to those high and uh, organizations, Fortune 100 companies, government entities, health plans. Um, that's what they're bidding on now. It's not to say that they won't bid on, uh, on a group of 100 lives or 1,000 lives or even 5,000 lives, but I can tell you up front, they're not getting the, the um, more aggressive financial arrangements that are available out there because they know they can write this business um, and still line their pockets a little bit, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna make them retire at the end of the day. Um, you know, we have a little quote here for PBM size matters. Um, many employers lack the size needed to receive the best pricing. Again, kind of falls in line with what the PBMs are doing. Um, insufficient support. Um, you know, these non Fortune 100 companies, you know, we talk about that void in the marketplace. When they go with a new organization, whether it be under medical, pharmacy, dental, vision, whatever the case may be, they're out there, you know, requesting the best financial arrangement they can get the best A team, account team, service team that they can get in the industry. And that also falls in line with any kind of clinical or what are, they, what are these organizations doing to manage trend. Um, that void is not dripping down or dripping down to the non-Fortune 100 companies, uh, many of which I'm sure are on this phone call now. Um, and again, most resources again are focused around the health plans, government and large commercial clients. So the next slide, I love, I love this slide. It kind of really puts it into perspective on 24. You can see who is carving out, right? So 95% of the Fortune 100 companies out there now are carving out their pharmacy benefit. They see the value in it. Um, the five that don't, that, you know, the 95% that do, but the five that don't, I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on this, but I'll kind of just throw it out there. The five Fortune 100 companies that currently do not carve out their pharmacy are all around the health plan side. So Aetna, Anthem, Cigna, United, and Humana do not ca carve out their pharmacy benefits. And you can understand why they're keeping all that information and all that data and all that income in-house. Um, you know, RX Benefits allows companies of all sizes to access pharmacy like the nation's largest plan sponsors. And I'll give you a perfect example, and I touched on it a second ago. Think of an Amazon. An Amazon was the last Fortune 100 company to decide to carve out their pharmacy benefits. And when you think of an Amazon, when they go out to bid, they're going to have their vendors knocking, knocking their door down to get in there to try to win that business. And again, whether it's medical, pharmacy, dental, vision, whatever the case may be, an Amazon is going gonna, is gonna to demand and quite frankly get the best financial arrangement that's out there. They're going to get that A service um, account team service throughout their in, throughout the company, and they're also going to get the best clinical resources that are available to help manage trying to keep costs down. So what RX Benefits does, and, and again we'll get into you know how our organization works with the pharmacy benefit companies, but what our company does is we look at every client as if they're an Amazon. You know we give each one of our self-funded clients, um, mid, non Fortune 100 clients that same feel that an Amazon's getting in the marketplace. We're giving them the best financial arrangement that's out there. We're giving them the best service teams that are out there across the board. And we're also giving the best clinical um, options that we can provide that are gonna keep costs down and diminish trend. Um, you'll understand a little bit about my organization, how we're able to do that compared to, you know, going carve out directly with the PBMs or keeping it carved in with the carriers. So that's a kind of great segue into slide 25, which kind of talks about the arrangements that are out there, you know, carved in versus carved out and, you know, what each one are saying, you know, under the carved in model, you know, obviously the health carrier holds the PBM contract 
where under the carved out model, the employer is going to hold the contract directly with the pharmacy benefit managed company or in my, in my, my regard, uh, RX benefits as that contract holder. Um, you know, when you think about what the carriers are doing around the contracts, I mean, you're lucky, and I'm sure Chris can attest to this. When you look at a, at a medical contract in a carved in situation with the pharmacy, you're lucky to see if there's even a blurb in the contract that talks about pharmacy, um, let alone what the discounts actually are. Are those, are those discounts guaranteed? Are there dispensing fees? What, where is my cost going from a carved in model? Um, from a rebate standpoint as well. I mean, you know, how much of the rebates are we as an organization, as an employer group gaining? Um, and where's the backup? Are you guys providing any reports that, that um, define what rebate I'm getting? Is it, is, it a, is it a check? Is it credit to my invoices? Is it a, a flat dollar amount? Or am I being paid on a PEPM fee-based, ASO fee-based situation? You know, the carriers and the PBMs are keeping a lot of the rebates. So when we do our financial analysis to show opportunity, we, we pass as an organization 100% of the rebates that we gain from the pharmacy benefit management companies that we partner with directly onto our clients. It's basically easy math. We take the flat dollar amount and the contract and multiply it by the total uh, rebatable claims. And that's what you're going to get on a quarterly basis from an organization like myself. Um, I think one of the important things here is the relationship with the insurer. The pharmacy is managed behind the scenes under a carved in situation, where under the carved out, the relationship is directly with the pharmacy benefit management company, or in my case, RX benefits. You know, I can talk firsthand. When I left Medco in 2006, I went to United Healthcare before it was Optum, and I worked on the carved in side of the business then. And quite frankly, you know, I was doing account management at the time and I'd have a Fortune 100 company that's, I'll just throw like Deutsche Bank out there who's headquarters in Chicago at the time. I would spend months at a time preparing for a pharmacy anal analysis, you know, just say it was a yearly meeting to kind of go through the numbers, where their spend was, how they were trending, offer up clinical recommendations. And again, I'd spend months preparing for my, my report and I, you know, go out with the, um, the medical account executive and be all ready for the meeting. And the whole meeting was really around medical. I'd spend months, as I said, and I'd have maybe 15 minutes to present pharmacy. And quite frankly, I mentioned before, you know, pharmacy cost is on the rise. It's, it's the highest entity out there now from a cost perspective. So how can I go on a carved in model and have 15 minutes to talk about where their pharmacy spend is? You know, when you think of the PBM world or the carved out world, I mean, that's all we're focused on. That's what we're doing. We're providing recommendations based off of your current utilization and offering up solutions that are going to lower trend and keep costs down. You're not going to get that under the, under the medical end of it. Um, you know, again, just to that point, the carriers or the carved ins are focused strictly on medical. Um, everything RX is under the carrier contract. Uh, where under the carved out, the focus is solely on pharmacy. It's the center of the desk. It's what we do on a daily basis. Um, I can tell you firsthand that the pharmacy economics involved under a carved in arrangement are not very aggressive at all. Once you kind of look at an analysis from a carved out side, more so through RX benefits, you can kind of see where, where there's actual dollars to be saved. And it's not just around, you know, the AWP discounts. It's not around dispensing fees and admin fees. That's probably half of the story. The other half is around rebates. So when I do an analysis and I look at opportunities and I'm showing on average 26% savings in that first year to carve out, uh, half is probably around the discounts and dispensing fees. The other half is all around rebates. Just shows you how much that the carriers are keeping on the rebate side. That's one of the ways they're making their money from a carved in standpoint. So the next slide, 26. Yeah, sorry, Chris. No, I was just, yeah. just, as you were mentioning before about the, the 10 minutes allocated, you know, in the meeting, we're looking to, you know, we're having meetings where it's exclusively on the prescription benefits, you know, we'll work with Rob and his team and really yeah, kind of looking at, you know, the year in re review and absolutely doing that deep dive. So it's much, much different. Yeah, de definitely. Thanks, Chris. So, so just to kind of continue that conversation on 26, advantages of carving out, you know, transparency on the contract terms and pricing, I mentioned the rebates, uh, detailed analytics, just to kind of go through the plan performance to show you where the dollars are being spent. 
Um, are there opportunities to look at the drugs that are being taken, especially around high cost drugs? Uh, the next bucket, cost containment. I mentioned, you know, we have very aggressive price negotiations. We offer, you know, under our benefits, all of our clients receive the same pricing points across their contracts. So if it's a 500 life group, 5,000 life group, 10,000 life group, they're all getting the same pricing points. So as you can see, you know, we're not looking to potentially line our pockets. I mean, of course, we're trying to make money, but at the end of the day, we're keeping all of our clients at the same level, all getting the same financial arrangements. Um, admin fees are not hidden within the medical benefits, which I kind of touched on. I mean, and then think about specialty as well. I mean, you know, in my world, I, you know, I think specialty needs to be carved out, not just from a financial aspect, but I mean, even from a service standpoint, you know, we still work with the pharmacy benefit managers, the PBMs that are out there, but, you know, containing and talking specialty is, is a totally different monster than taking a multi-source medication or an, or an antibiotic. There needs to be a lot of hand-holding. There needs a lot of clinical intervention, a lot of people looking at the medication, making sure it's working correctly. Are the members taking it at the right time? Um, are they having any side effects, things of that nature? And I can guarantee you, you're not seeing that on a carved in basis. They're not, they don't have the resources from a pharmacy end to kind of provide that kind of service. Um, I mentioned before, you know, it's all we do. We're the experts in pharmacy. We're just focused on managing pharmacy benefits. Um, Rx Benefits has put a lot of resources into our clinicians and pharmacists. We brought a lot of pharmacy, pharmacists in-house so we can kind of take that over from the pharmacy benefit managers. And then Chris touched on this before, you know, under um, improved data management with modeling and forecasting. You know, that's where I think, you know, going from a fully insured to a self-funded uh, opportunity really kind of provides that much more uh, flexibility and trend management. <clears throat> so you'll hear out there, you know, the arguments for carving in, right? This is coming from exactly the medical vendors. And the first and foremost that's always up there is like, hey, the carved in model is a connected model. Um, Everything is in-house. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to do that with the pharmacy benefit management companies. Well, you know, I'd say 15, 20 years ago, that might have been an, an argument. Um, and I went against it all the time. But, you know, now in the real world, what's going on today, there's, you know, we provide, we, we're connected with all the uh, carriers, stop loss vendors, um, reinsurers, TPAs, uh, PBMs, where we can share daily data feeds with all those organizations. So all those reports, all those files are in-house. So that's not even, I think, up to debate anymore. Um, is it best to bundle pharmacy and medical? Um, you know, I don't think under the carved in versus carved out model, that's the case anymore. And just kind of looking in the analytics and the analyses I'm able to do, as I mentioned, and I'll throw this number out there again, because it's, it's a true number based off of my own bats, my own stats. When I look at an opportunity on a carved out side and say the client, let's just use Aetna for an example. If I have a client that's currently carved in Aetna and I look for opportunities under Rx benefits to save them money, from a carved in to a carved out, I am showing well over 30% on average savings. Again, just on the financials, contract, rebates, dispensing fees. When I look at a client that potentially is already carved out with one of the PBMs, whether it be CVS, ESI, Optum, or anybody else for that matter, I am showing close, on average, 26% uh, first year savings um, just on the financials alone. So, you know, the bundled pricing under the medical is, is not nearly up to par uh, from a carved out standpoint. And then again, health carriers can, can handle it all. You know, not, not true. The carved out model has the resources, the expertise within our organization to fully manage trend and keep costs down. So kind of just looking into the pharmacy contracts, you know, as it says here, a good pharmacy partner can help you understand what's being offered and help answer some of these questions that are outlined here below. And this, these are some of the things I talk with Chris on a daily basis um, about his book of business. So what Rx Benefits is able to do when we work with our brokers, we try to be that pharmacy broker to the broker, the pharmacy consultant to the consultant, because that's what we do on a daily basis. I don't necessarily work with the larger uh, brokerage houses that are out there, or consulting firms like an Aon or a, or a Gallagher, because they have their own practice uh, leads in-house. My focus is kind of on 
on like a, like a Hampton consulting firm or some other boutique consultant firms that are out there where we become the pharmacy expert to help them kind of navigate through some of the things we talked about and some of these questions that are outlined here before. So things to look at, you know, what are the pricing terms and length of a contract? You know, one of the things that Arts Benefits prides itself on is we only do one-year contracts. Um, as you probably are all aware, most of your contracts with the carriers or the PBMs for that matter, or any other vendor, are probably all three-year deals. And when you kind of think about that, when the pricing goes into place, yeah, it looks great. The first year, the first quarter, second quarter, we're showing savings. But funny thing happens down the line is that these contracts, because they're three-year deals, the pricing starts to become stagnant and it comes stagnant as quickly as by the third quarter of that first year. So one of the things our benefits does, and, and we do this consistently with our PBM partners, is that we negotiate our contracts with our pharmacy benefit management partners twice a year. And what's good about that is, as I mentioned, our contracts are one year deals. So when we renegotiate with our PBM partners, we're able to pass those savings directly onto our clients on a yearly basis. So the clients are receiving uh, improvement in their financials of anywhere between eight and 12% on a yearly basis by doing absolutely nothing. We automatically renew our clients. We have a 94% retention rate year over year. Um, and those clients are seeing the value of just the financial negotiations that we can provide them. Um, and it's important to note too that all our pricing points are guaranteed at the client level. So if we fall short on any one of our guarantees, whether it be a retail brand discount, if we, show, if we fall short of what that uh, guarantee is, we're going to true up to that client at the end of the year. We provide quarterly reports um, to show them how they're performing. Those are shared with the likes of Chris as well as our clients. So again, at the end of the year, if we fall short, we're going to true up at the end of the year to make those contracts whole. And on the flip side, if we actually over um, perform over what those discounts are, our benefits does not keep any of the spread. We pass those anything over those discounts directly back to our clients. Um, other things to look at, you know, what what's the exit strategy on a contract? What's the audit process? Are you able to kind of go out for market check within that three year deal? Um, you know, just little things to look at. And next, you know, how are branded generic drugs defined? You know, a lot of the carriers, a lot of the PBM contracts, like I said, are are built in the best interest of the PBM. So there's a lot of optics out there. So I'll give you a perfect example. There's a thing out there called single source generics. And those, those are really, can be in a contract, put in a brand uh, discount bucket where they're not getting as high a discount as they would under a generic. And we as an organization would put a single source generic in the generic bucket from a, from a reimbursement standpoint to our clients. Um, not all the carriers and not all the PBMs are doing that. You really need somebody that understands the contracts. Uh, again, what are the type of re, re, rebate arrangement is there? Are you getting full value of your rebates? Are you getting 100% of what the PBMs are getting, what the carriers are getting? And the answer to that is no way. Um, and where's the backup? You know, Show me where this dollar amount is coming from or this credit is coming from. We provide detailed reporting that supports what the rebates are. And again, it's, it's really easy math. And are there any contract guarantees that I just talked about? Is it at the client level? Is it at a book of business level? I mean, quite frankly, you know, I think every guarantee in the contract should be at the exact client level. Why should how another client is performing have an effect on, on my contractual guarantees? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> So next slide, just talking about contract length, as I mentioned, you know, we stale pricing in the second and third years, if not the third quarter of that first year. Um, inability to respond to the rapidly changing pharmacy landscape. I mean, what, what clinical programs, what else are you doing to help manage what's changing in the marketplace? And then costly to exit a contract early, you know, really comes down to the ability, the ability to negotiate, um, to get out of a contract early. I've had many opportunities uh, now in the sales side where you know, a, client, a client may be apprehensive about moving because they still have six or seven months left on a contract or maybe even a year. Uh, you know, what are the penalties for potentially doing that? I can tell you up front, working in this industry, usually what's gonna happen, there's gonna be a penalty by, by the carrier or the PBM to terminate early. We'll probably keep any earned rebates um, 
by the time you provide your termination notice up to the life of the contract. I mean, you guys have probably seen this from a, from a carrier standpoint. A lot of the carriers are doing different things out there now, like an Aetna and a Cigna. They're not allowing um, pharmacy to be carved out for lives less than 500. But, you know, I have seen opportunities where, you know, clients and brokers have gone back to the, to the carriers and said, hey, listen, you know, an RX benefits is going to save me 40% in pharmacy spend. You know, what are you doing to help manage? You know, you're supposed to be a partner. What are you doing to help me save money on the pharmacy side when I have an organization that's guaranteeing me 40% in overall savings based off of my data? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think a lot of those carriers are going to say, all right, listen. You know, we understand we'll let you carve it out, but we want to keep the medical. I mean, they'd be smart to do that. Um, those are just little things you have to think about. Um, you know, some of the other games the carriers are doing, if they are allowing them to carve it out, they're charging a penalty fee, or for lack of a better phrase, a penalty fee on, on their ASO fees. I've seen Aetna charging anywhere between $17 and $22 on a PEPM basis to allow a client to carve out their pharmacy. And if that's the case, you know, you know, Chris would provide me with that information. I build it into my analysis and, you know, obviously would have an effect on the overall savings, but I'm still showing well over, you know, 20% in annual savings just based on that. I'm sure there's a lot of questions around there. Hopefully we'll have some time to kind of talk about them. So as you kind of go to the next slide, I'm going to, Chris, if we can just actually skip to 33 real fast and I'll come back to 32. So. So our expenses is kind of build on a three prong kind of service situation. And I'll break each one down. The first one here on 33 is, you know, in our book of business, our expenses has about 2.5 million lives, which equates to around 3 billion in annual drug spend. And what we're able to do as an organization is we partner with the three largest PBMs in the industry, which I mentioned before, ESI, CVS, and Opera. And because of those 2.5 million lives, we're able to negotiate very aggressive financial terms on behalf of our clients um, that those clients would not be able to get on a direct basis, whether it's on a carrier level or a carved out model on their own. Um, and I mentioned the savings before, 26% annual savings from a carved out to a carved out arrangement, um, from a carved into a carved out, probably closer to 40% on an annual basis, especially that first year. Um, so we're able to negotiate these very aggressive uh, pricing points, uh, shorter contract terms. You know, I mentioned a one year to a three year from a three year contract and 100 percent of the rebates that we earn from the PBMs, we pass directly on to our clients. You know, self-funded non Fortune 100 clients are not going to be able to get these arrangements on their own. So that's what we're able to do. And, and the discounts, you know, it comes down to discounts, rebates, dispensing fees, admin fees. Um, that's important to know. So if we kind of go back to 32, this kind of defines what we do with our second pillar, which is really around the service aspect. And what I kind of try to refer to is we try to leverage the, most, the best of both worlds. So everything you see here in the upper quadrant is what RX benefits in reality takes over from the carriers in the PBM. So we bring this all in house as an organization from my role as a business development executive which quite frankly is just a, fa a fancy way of saying sales, to contracting, implementation, eligibility, billing, reporting, marketing, clinical, member services, client services, customer service. We bring that all in-house now and it's managed by RX Benefits. We have over 500 employees across the United States. The company is based out of Birmingham, Alabama. I'm sure as most of you have heard from my Southern draw, I am not from Alabama. Um, I reside and work out of my home office in New Jersey, um, but all of these aspects we bring in the house. So the carriers, the PBMs, you will no longer use them from a customer service standpoint, from an account management side, which, you know, in my mind is, is, is fantastic that now it's all managed through our benefits. You get that Southern hospitality from Alabama. Um, the phone lines, there are no queues. You get somebody on the phone right away, whether that be your members or the actual clients themselves, the brokers and the clients call into our, um, our client services team, the members call directly into our customer service teams um, or account management teams for the brokers and the consultants. Um, each client is provided a strategic account executive and account manager. Account manager would handle most of the day-to-day -day operations where the strategic account executive would handle a lot of the plan building, recommendations, 
uh, working with a clinical representative on each account to provide insight into the clinical programs that we provide specifically under their own client members utilization. Um, again, those, those clinical opportunities are, are all voluntarily. We don't throw those down anybody's throat, but they're good to kind of bring up in discussions. When I look at an analysis, I'll bring them up front during the analysis to kind of talk about them, but it's all gonna be part of the ongoing service that you're gonna get um, for the length of the contract that you're with us. With that said, we still do rely on our PBM partners to provide some background, some aspects, some things that, that we feel as an organization they are very good at. So when you kind of look at the bottom here, we still use um, the pharmacy benefit management companies for the adjudication of the claims. We use them for their networks, their retail, their mail, their specialty networks. Um, and we use them as the aggregator of the rebates. Um, so again, we do pass 100% of the rebates that we get, but they are the actual aggregator of it. Um, we, I know mentions clinical resources here, that's actually um, needs to be removed, but we use them for their member portals, member and pharmacy websites, the mobile apps, um, and they're available to our members and our clients and our brokers um, from an after hour standpoint or emergency situations where say they can't get anybody on the line, we're closed, those calls are directly routed to, to the actual PBM that a client is under. And then the third aspect, which you know, kind of digs into the program management on, on the upcoming slides, is really around clinical management and some of the programs that we're talking about out there. So you know, the, clinical, the clinical recommendations, the clinical aspect, the clinical resources, all lines into like a proactive pharmacy benefit management, which is a cornerstone of any pharmacy strategy. So at first, you want to make sure that the medication out there is looking at it, make sure it's the right drug, is it the right person? Is it the right cost? Is it the right reason? So when we talk about right reason, okay, is it following FDA guidelines? Is the medication being taken for the diagnosis that it's been approved for? Um, is it, again, the right person? Is there a potential coding error? Is there a potentially fraud issue? Is there a potential keying error? Somebody put in the wrong dosage. It's just a lot of things that on a carved inside, we're able to look at that they're not seeing on a carved, uh, I'm sorry, on a carved out relationship that they're not seeing on a carved in arrangement. And these are just some of the demands, you know, pharmacy approach, you know, managed pharmacy as a standalone ar arrangement, proactive drug management, few formulary strategies, coming up with recommendations around clinical and innovative programs, which we, we've done a great job at, um, negotiate comprehensive contracts, discounts, optimize rebates and discounts, um, offer flexible network options. You, you know, we, I guess I mentioned, we follow what the PBMs are doing from a network standpoint. So if somebody's currently um, utilizing a CVS network, when they potentially move over to an RX benefit situation, you're not going to see any formulary disruption there because we're using the formularies that the PBMs are using. So there should not be any disruption going from a CVS to a CVS or an ESI to an ESI. Um, Strong focus on specialty drugs, as I mentioned, you know, the high cost that's going on there. Um, leverage a client-focused boutique service model, why we work with the likes of, of a Hampton Consulting Group. You know, we feel there's a good partnership there to work in conjunction with each other. You know, even more so, look at the call that we're having today. And, a, and access to targeted trend management solutions. Again, that all falls under some of the, the clinical programs that we're able to offer. And if anybody has any questions on those, you know, let's table them, you know, almost done here. We can talk about some of what we're doing around a specialty to, to help curb the trend on specialty medications. You know, and we talk about proactive management. What, what kind of goes into that? And I mentioned before, regular claims analyses, we help to support a proactive manager approach, um, looking at over dro overall drug spend, cost trends, utilization trends, um, provide modeling um, to kind of look at some of those uh, potential opportunities. And that's really what we do as an organization. I'll kind of hand it back to Chris. Um, Chris, if you go to page 39, just real quick, I'll just show you, this is an example of one of the pharmacies analysis that I'll work with Chris and show him on a daily basis when he brings opportunities to me. Um, as you can see, the company here up on the left was around 200 employees, which equated to almost 500 members. When we kind of look at this analysis, this is just a snapshot of the overall 
um, answers that we provide. The first column is the incumbent that our clients currently are under. The next few tabs here are in regards to all of our PBM partners, and it breaks down all the answers. So subsequent pages when we do an analysis, it's probably about 20 pages overall. But again, this is the answer. We show the exact savings from a gross claim amount paid to claims amount by, by the employer taking out the member copay. We build any rebate dollars, any credits that or dispensing fees that may be out there. And at the very bottom, you'll see our overall savings are, are highlighted there at the bottom in green um, with the actual dollar amount. And I think it's important to note here too, is that these are true savings. So let's just say this data here was provided for all of 2019 for XYZ client. What we're able to do is show you, okay, had this client been with RX benefits for all of 2019, this is what their costs would have been highlighted in green below. It's not saying what we would save you in 2020, but you can just imagine that those savings will be a direct correlation to what you're seeing below here in the green. So I, I appreciate everybody's time. You know, I'll let Chris kind of finish up and then if there's any questions, uh, I'm sure Chris and I are both here to answer them. So that's all I have, Chris. You on mute? Did I lose Chris? Not sure if you're talking, Chris, but I don't think anybody can hear you. I know I can't. I know you're out there. I see your mouse moving. I apologize, everybody. I don't know if Chris is speaking. I can't hear him. Um, I'll stay on for another couple minutes here to see if we're able to hear him at some point, but I apologize. I don't have access to the mute button. And I know I think Chris muted everybody on the on the line. I apologize. Can you hear me there? Yeah, I hear you now, Chris. Sorry about that. Dropped off the call there. My apologies, everyone. No worries. So everyone able to see the screen still? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, great. Great. Just want to make sure. It looks like it looks like one question came in from uh, Howie Gerver. I don't know yep. if you see that. Um, oh, nice job yep, today, Rob. Pay? Question. The RS data feeds, I guess, are they daily? Yeah, they are daily. We provide them, as I mentioned, we can provide them directly to the carriers, uh, stop loss, um, you know, TPAs, whatever the case may be. Quite frankly, RX Benefits is, is I haven't come across any one vendor, um, TPA, stop loss that I, we have not been connected to. Um, I will say if we're not connected to them, um, we can set those files up relatively easy. You know, we get their IT folks, our IT folks on the phone, um, kind of walk through it. We do not charge for any data feeds at all, whether it's set up or the actual feeds. Not to say that a stop loss or a TPA may charge for that, but we won't charge for that. And the setup is relatively easy. And I guess just a related question to that, Rob, in terms of like a lead time for a group generally, if they're looking to make the transition out, usually it's always on anniversary of their plan. What, what, what kind of lead time do, uh, do you require to get a group up and running? So, so great question. I'll answer that two ways. First, um, you know, I think in a perfect world, most clients would like to move, you know, when their contract is up. Uh, quite frankly, as an organization, if they're a 7-1, you know, contract end date, you know, we can put them in. 8191, whatever the case may be, we would just work with their incumbent to get like a, I forget the term, I apologize, um, but we can work with them on getting a file, you know, as long as they're still providing that benefit. 
but our lead time is anything off 1-1 or even 2-1 for that matter, we require a 60-day implementation timeline. So for example, for um, for eight, uh, what we're coming up on, for a 6-1 uh, potential move to Rx benefits, we would need notification by 4-1. So a 60-day implementation timeline is usually what we require. January and February, just because of how busy we are, um, how busy the, the pharmacy benefit management companies are, then we require 90 days. Gotcha. And then you had touched on one uh, briefly before about the reporting, just the quarterly reporting. Um, you know, and that's been a real benefit in terms of being able to sit down with groups and actually show them, okay, here's where the, where the numbers really are. That, that's something regularly with, the, with all employer groups you're sitting down and doing, correct? Yeah, that's a good question, a good point, Chris, because, you know, every client differs. So, you know, you have some clients that are out there that, you know, want to see quarterly reporting um, or biannual or annual. Um, you know, obviously, we're able to do that across the board, um, but we're also able to set up robot jobs. So if there's specific information any one client needs, we can set up robot jobs through the implementation process and the account team will manage you know, just provide the specific specs and, you know, we'll program that into our systems and send those directly out to the clients at the end of each month. Um, one thing I didn't touch on before that I think is kind of important as well is that we're, because we partner with each of these uh, three PBM uh, leaders in the industry, we're actually built into each one of their systems as well. So we're getting the, the claims information in real time. When a phone call comes in, our customer service reps, account management teams, um, member services are going directly into each one of the PBM's systems and are able to kind of look at data, provide reports based off of that data in a real-time situation. So there's not a delay from that standpoint. We have insight to all those systems. Is that kind of where you were going, Chris? Yes, absolutely. So I was just pulling up the additional question here that we had from uh, Howie. I don't yeah. know if you see that there, Rob. I do. Yeah, so so good question, Howie. And, and I will say it, th say it this way. I mean, if it's whatever is more beneficial from a cost saving standpoint for our clients, we will we will do and look at recommendations. I mean, some of the J codes, you know, that are under the medical side actually do represent, you know, specialty injections, things of that nature. So if it's more cost savings worthy to move that over to the pharmacy side, then yeah, we'll, we'll work with the client, we'll work with the medical vendor to bring those in house and have them covered under the pharmacy benefit. We don't have any restrictions on doing that whatsoever. Um, quite frankly, I'm not sure if the medical side would because obviously that's gonna lose them revenue at the end of the day, but we will work with our clients and if it makes you know sense to bring it over to the pharmacy, then we'll definitely do that. Hope that answers your question. Right. Great question. You're welcome. All right. Well, I want to be respectful of uh, everybody's time today. I've run a little bit over, but I appreciate everybody's attendance. Um, as we had mentioned, if uh, there are any additional questions after the fact, uh, please feel free. Just reach out to us at info at benefitsqb.com, and we can uh, get in touch with Rob and get you uh, answers to your question as quickly as possible. And additionally, as I mentioned before, too, if you have uh, questions regarding any of the recent developments with regard to COVID-19 or any general basic compliance issues with regard to group benefits, please don't hesitate to reach out. We appreciate everybody's time today. Rob, thank you for an awesome job. Really well done. Thanks, Chris. And and, and again, I'll just throw out any follow-up. You know, I, I know, uh, Chris, you were mentioning it to, you know, throw it to you. If you need to share my email with anybody on the phone, that's more than fine. Um, you know, if somebody wants to reach out via phone, that's fine as well. By all means, you can provide them my number. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm Great. available. I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm in the house. So, <laughs> um, and we can, uh, absolutely. If folks are interested, we can, uh, after the fact, just shoot us an email there at info at .com, and we can send you a link for the recording and uh, also provide you with Rob's information as well. Thanks everybody. Stay healthy. All right. Thanks Rob. Take care everyone.